Hey y'all, I am currently in the space that is my home office because um, we are in Snowmageddon 3.0 here in Oklahoma, which is very rare for us. I am from Texas, so prior to moving to Oklahoma, I could count on one hand how many times it had snowed in Texas with me growing up as an adult. I maybe three times. When we moved to Oklahoma, we get snow, a decent snow, maybe once a year. But we are currently shut down. I shouldn't say Snowmageddon. I should say Ice Mageddon 3.0 because this is the third time here in 2025 that we have had crazy cold, insane weather that us people from the South, we are not used to. So we've mainly gotten maybe only two inches of snow, which I know does not sound bad compared to a lot of people, but we have a lot of ice. Our roads are solid ice. We are in a very rural area, so we don't have salt trucks or things like that because we don't really need them here, but it's currently two degrees outside. It feels negative 18. We were off on Monday because of President's Day. I didn't think of what day it was because of President's Day, but then we were out yesterday and today because of ice and temperatures. And then we're waiting to see if we are going to even have school tomorrow. It was really funny. I posted in my Facebook group yesterday, I said, who is out because of this crazy weather? And people were posting who live in northern states, Minnesota, North Dakota, all of that, how it felt negative 52 and kids were hanging out at the bus stop. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So here on the days that we, obviously we do have school, if it is below 32 degrees, we cannot take our kids outside for recess. And there were all of these comments about, um, we can't go outside if it's below zero. And I'm, I just would not survive in a Northern state. I would take our 105 degree weather days over this 10 degree negative temperature days <laughs> any day. But with that being said, I have been off. So I'm using this time to clean up my office space. It's become a catch all since I went back into the classroom. So I'm cleaning up and then today we're gonna to be talking about word problems. I posted this poll right here on my Instagram yesterday asking teachers if you realized that there is more than two types of word problems. There's not just addition and subtraction. There's actually 11 different types of word problems that kids are exposed to by the end of second grade. And that is what we are gonna be talking about today. So I am gonna finish cleaning up my area right here and then we're gonna dive in and get started. If you've ever had students freeze up when solving word problems, see what I did there? You're not alone. Teaching word problems can be tough, but once we break them down into different structures, everything just starts to make sense for us and our students. So today we're going to dive into word problem types. We're going to talk about what they are, why they matter, and how we can help our students solve them with confidence. Does that sound good? Let's start out with what are word problem types? Word problems aren't just about numbers. They're about understanding situations. Research tells us that students struggle with word problems not because of the math itself, but because they don't recognize the structure of the problem. When we explicitly teach word problem types, students learn to recognize the different patterns and apply these strategies instead of just guessing. There are four main word problem structures for addition and subtraction. We have join, separate, part whole, and compare. Each one has different variations, which we're gonna break down in just a second. But first I wanna talk about why all of this matters because let's be real, word problems can be frustrating. Am I right? They can be frustrating for us. They can be frustrating for students. And that's because problem solving requires a lot more than just one skill at one time. We've got reading, reasoning, choosing the right math operation, and so much more. But when we teach students to recognize word problem structures, they start to see patterns. Instead of just asking, do I add or do I subtract? They learn to analyze the situation 
And then that's when those light bulb moments happen and that's the game changer. So let's break down these four types of word problem structures. First up, we have join problems. These are addition situations where something is added to a starting amount. I am a pretty visual person, so I am gonna be sharing some charts and hopefully this is gonna help you understand what I am saying. So let's take a look at this example. Gabriel has four books. His dad gave him six more books. How many books does he have now? This is a super common type of problem, right? This is actually the most common type of problem our kids are gonna see. But there are three variations of join problems. We have results unknown, change unknown, and start unknown. Results unknown problems, the example that I just showed you, are when a student is solving for the total or sum. These types of problems, something is being added on to or onto something else. Then we have change unknown problems. These are different and involve missing add-ins. We know the start and end of a problem, but not what is being added. Your students are gonna need to set this up for a missing add-in problem in order to solve for the missing number. We also have start unknown problems. These are very similar, except here we do not know the starting number, but what we do know is what is being added on and we know the result. Up next, we have separate problems, which are just the opposite. Instead of adding something is being taken away. In this example, we have Madison has nine books. She loses six of them. How many books does Madison have now? Again, we have three different variations. We have results unknown, change unknown, and start unknown. Results unknown problems, the example, is solving for the final amount. Change and start unknown problems are when a missing number is involved. Change unknown problems, we know the start and we know the end, but we do not know the number that was removed in the problem. Start unknown problems, we know what was removed and we know the result, but we don't know the starting number. Each separate problem has a different action. Therefore, the strategy to solve them is very different. There are other two types of word problems. They are part whole and compare. These types of problems are different because there is no direct action involved. Let's talk about part whole problems. These are different because they do not involve a change over time. There is no direct or implied action. Since one number is not joined to another, both sets or numbers have the same role within the problem. These problems either give two parts and ask to find the whole, or they give only one part and the whole and ask the solver to find the other part. What you're gonna notice is that nothing is being added onto. Let's look at some examples. There are three blue crayons and five red crayons on the table. How many crayons are there in all? This is a whole unknown problem. Here we have two parts and they need to be able to find the whole. The blue crayons and the red crayons have the same thing within the problem. Nothing is being added to them. This is what makes them different from a join type problem. For part unknown, there is no implied action. We have the whole, but one of the parts is missing. Because the actions are different, so will the strategy to solve for each problem type. Now, last up, we have compare problems. These focus on comparing two amounts to find the difference. Compare problems like part, part, whole involve relationships between quantities rather than joining or separating an action. These are the most challenging types of problems that our students are going to see. Now, I'm not going to read every single one of these problems, but you can see that compare problems deal with how many more and how many fewer. These are often worded trickier and require more complex thinking. Unknown and smaller unknown problems are challenging because they can be asking for more or fewer in various ways within the problem. With bigger unknown problems, we know the smaller number and difference, but we don't know the larger number. With smaller unknown problems, we know the larger number and we know the difference, but we don't know the smaller number. Ah, that sounds so confusing, right? Because <sighs> that was a lot. But by knowing these structures can make a huge difference for our students. 
All right, so how do we help students actually use this knowledge? Here are a few tips. One, we want to use lots of models and visuals. We want to act out problems using counters and drawing models to show what is actually happening. Another thing is to teach keywords with caution. Instead of relying on keywords alone, focus on the problem structure. I have an entire blog post dedicated to why I no longer teach keywords explicitly. I'm gonna leave that link in the description of the video. Also, encourage multiple solution strategies because what works best for one student might not work for the other. Acknowledge that a problem can be solved in so many different ways. Also, practice with real world context. Make word problems relatable by using real life examples from students' everyday experiences. If you live in a rural area, your students are not gonna relate to a word problem about parking garages or skyscrapers. The same goes for urban areas. Students who live in a big city are probably not gonna relate to a word problem about cows in a pasture. It's just not gonna happen. And then you probably know this, but just make sure that you're scaffolding your instruction. Use the gradual release approach to teach word problems by model problem solving and thinking aloud, then solve problems collaboratively as a class, then have students work in pairs or small groups, and then eventually move into independent practice. The goal is to help students see patterns so they don't feel lost when they see a word problem. I have so many blog posts and YouTube videos all about different word problem strategies. I'm gonna drop some links in the description. Now, if you are looking for resources to help you with word problem types, I've definitely got you covered. I'm gonna link some of my favorite activities and strategies in the description below that align with all of the problem types I just shared. So you can go check them out. And also, did you know that you can get instant access to all of my first, second, and third grade math resources, including my word problem practice inside of the Inner Circle Math membership? I actually just added this word problem section for our Inner Circle family, and I'm going to be adding more to it in the incoming weeks. You are going to get access to daily word problems aligned with each month that include addition and subtraction to 20 as well as other skills and it includes numberless word problems. Then over the next couple of days I'm going to be adding all of my resources that align with all of the word problem types that I just shared. You get access to all of this inside the inner circle. You can just click on what you need and then you're going to see a description of the resource. And then over here in the file section, you can download to save it to your computer. That's just one of the many resources you have access to inside of the Inner Circle Math membership. You can check out the link in the description to learn more about the Inner Circle and join today. And also, if this video was helpful, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future tips. Thanks for hanging out with me today, and I will see you guys in the next video. Y'all have a blessed one. Bye.